Hi, this is Michael Altos. We are continuing our discussion of endocrine physiology. This is recording part four. The pancreas has two distinct functions, exocrine and endocrine. The exocrine function involves secreting digestive enzymes into the, into the digestive system. And the endocrine function, which we'll focus on now, is the hormone function, secreting insulin and glucagon into the circulation. Insulin is a peptide synthesized in pancreatic beta cells. It facilitates transport of glucose into cells, and it also causes uh, transport of potassium into cells. Insulin shifts metabolism towards storage, formation of glycogen, synthesis of lipids, synthesis of protein. This is called anabolism, or an anabolic hormone. When insulin is absent, or if blood glucose is very low, then fat is broken down for energy, and this process is called lipolysis. And eventually the patient will form ketones, specifically the following three, acetoacetic acid, acetone, and beta-hydroxybutyric acid. The ketones can be used as an alternate source of energy in the absence of glucose. The body normally secretes one unit per hour of insulin, but in response to food or stress, this is elevated, and so total secretion per day is in the average of 40 to 50 units. Cortisol, catecholamines, glucagon, and growth hormone all lead to hyperglycemia. Alpha stimulation decreases insulin and increases glucagon, and beta stimulation and parasympathetic stimulation will increase insulin. The insulin receptors get saturated at surprisingly low insulin concentrations, which means that a continuous infusion of one to two units per hour may actually be more effective than a large one-time bolus. Although large boluses do take longer to clear than small boluses, leading to a greater net effect in some patients. Insulin is metabolized by the kidneys and the liver with a half time of five to 10 minutes, but the effect clinically may be sustained for as long as 30 to 60 minutes because insulin is so tightly bound to its receptors. When we give exogenous insulin, the biggest risk of course is hypoglycemia. And if we attempt very tight glucose control, we may see more hypoglycemia as a side effect. Many diabetic patients, especially type 2 diabetics, become insulin resistant, where their insulin requirement goes up and up in order to achieve a given effect. Glucagon is the anti-insulin. It is secreted from the alpha cells of the pancreas and is stimulated by hypoglycemia, hypoglycemia stress, trauma, cortisol, and sepsis. Glucagon causes mobilization of glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids back into the systemic circulation. It also increases hepatic production of glucose. Glucagon is not a catecholamine, but it acts like one because it increases cyclic AMP. As a result, glucagon will increase myocardial contractility, stroke volume, and heart rate, and can actually work even in the presence of significant beta blockade. Glucagon leads to bile secretion and may be used during the ERCP procedure as a 1 to 2 milligram IV bolus. Side effects of glucagon include nausea and vomiting and hyperglycemia, and it has a short elimination half time of 3 to 6 minutes. Hyperglycemia will lead to increased osmotic pressure in the extracellular fluid and cellular dehydration. As glucose is lost in the urine, an osmotic diuresis occurs, similar to what we see with mannitol, and patients will lose fluids and electrolytes. Many, many tissues can be damaged by chronic hyperglycemia, especially blood vessels, where we'll see increased risk for heart attack, stroke, end-stage renal disease, hypertension, blind blindness, neuropathy, autonomic dysfunction, and limb ischemia or gangrene. The hemoglobin A1c represents the three-month average plasma glucose concentration, where normal is below 
and hemoglobin A1C level correlates very well with the patient's rate of complications in the perioperative period. The perioperative period is associated with insulin hyposecretion and therefore increased insulin resistance and hyperglycemia. Many procedures will have worse outcomes in the setting of hyperglycemia. Studies have shown an 18-fold increased risk of in-hospital mortality and many other markers including increased length of stay, risk of infection, and subsequent need for nursing home care. On the other hand, relatively tight glucose, blood glucose control has shown improved outcomes when using intensive insulin therapy. This is especially true to reduce long-term mortality in ICU and cardiac patients, but as always we need to be careful because overly aggressive blood glucose control is associated with worse outcomes. For that reason, we usually set our blood glucose target as below 180 milligrams per deciliter. What should we do about patients who have preoperative hyperglycemia? This is a big and ongoing question and you'll find a lot of different recommendations and guidelines depending on how old or recent they are. If you look into Barish's anesthesia textbook, uh, he says that there are really no evidence-based guidelines existing currently as far as when you should cancel a surgical procedure due to hyperglycemia. And he actually goes on to say these evidence-based guidelines are unlikely to be forthcoming. There are an awful lot of different patient and surgical factors involved. Some hospitals have a policy that if the pre-op blood sugar is greater than 300, this will serve as a trigger to evaluate the patient for ketoacidosis, which would include a urine ketone dipstick or sending a whole blood chemistry. And there are those who recommend postponing non-urgent or elective surgery if there is an acute rise in glucose to above 400 milligrams per deciliter. We'll stop our discussion of diabetes here and continue it in the next recording.